struggle with family sometimes. Family can be hugely challenging. There can be ups and there can be downs. And the challenges is that you're with them all the time when it's up and when it's down and you get to walk through life with them. And so what if today we look at some very practical steps and very pragmatic things that can help us walk out some of that stuff in our lives. When we got done recording the message today, I said to Pastor and I go, I've never heard a pastor talk about family in the way you did today. So I think you're gonna be blessed. I think you're gonna be challenged. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Welcome to church. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God And I love your voice you have led me through the fire In the darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after me, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after me, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after me, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me.
Welcome everybody to our online campus, week two of our series, Stronger. Big shout out to Crossroads Recovery. Guys, we love you so much. We're so proud of you in Christ and the growth that you're seeing in your life. Big shout to Pastor Todd, the campus pastor there. Dude, love you and was so excited. The baptisms on Easter, guys, I'm gonna say it again, was phenomenal. 22 of you guys baptized on Easter. So here we go, continuing on with our series today. Let's just dive into week two. Now, We all want to be a person who's unaffected by what other people do and what they say. We wish we didn't let little things in life annoy us so much. Can I get a mm mm-hmm from everybody out there online? Now, resilience, which is a very powerful word that's used in counseling worlds, says this. Resilience is defined by the American Psychological Association as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, like doing our taxes this last week, okay? So here's a question. What kind of a story do you want to tell about your life? Do you want the story like we used to tell when we were teenagers? Like, dude, remember the guy who popped off and you kicked his butt? And dude, you were so bad, you know what? You were such a tough guy, no one ever pushed you around. Do you want a teenage story? Do you want an adolescent story? Or do we want to tell a story that deep down inside we all admire? Like how you took the high road, how you didn't uh, wrong that person who wronged you, how you didn't punch back when you got punched. You see, you can't push forward if you're punching backward. Counselors agree, the most important step in building inner strength is staying connected. It's all about relationships. Relationships are a vital part of staying strong and keeping a strong perspective. In fact, having a strong relationship or relationships in your life is one of the greatest predictors of your mortality, the length of your life. It's the best predictor of all. Matter of fact, it's more of a a predictor than any other healthy lifestyle behavior. No matter how much water you drink, no matter how much you juice, no matter how much fiber you take in, um, no matter what you do, no matter how much you exercise, your relationships and the strength of your relationships is the greatest predictor of your mortality rate, how long you're going to live. We need to invest in our relationships more than we're investing in all the other things that we do in the physical, all right? In this series, we're talking about three levels of relationships. Last week, we talked about our relationship with God. This week, we're gonna talk about something that's a little bit complicated. We're gonna talk about our relationships with family. All right, just turn, if you're watching with somebody, just turn to them and go, that's a little complicated. When a family is working, life just works better. And here's why, because family is foundational. We're gonna talk more about this in our heart cruise this week. Those of you watching on our online campus, you're gonna connect with some friends this week and maybe talk a little bit about this message, encourage them to watch it, and then talk to them about it. We, We get out from behind screens and we connect with people and we talk to them and we grow together. If you're on one of our campuses this week, you just wanna encourage you, get out of the rows, get into circles, get into community and talk about this this week. Get into your heart cruise. So here we go. Family is so foundational because God created us this way. He made us to live and to thrive within family. Right after God creates the world, he creates a family to live in the world that he made, Adam and Eve. As a matter of fact, when God makes the world and he creates Adam, the only thing that he says that isn't good, this is not good about his creation, he's he's creating all, all these beautiful, powerful things. He says, it is good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And then in Genesis chapter two, verse 18, God says this. Then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And all the women watching said, amen, just let's keep it to yourself, ladies, all right? And he goes on, he says, I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, listen to Adam's response when he first sees Eve. This is so good. God creates Eve right from man, and, and Adam lays eyes on her for the first time. The Bible says they were naked and unashamed. Let's go. This is what it says, Genesis 2, verse 23. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Such poetry here. She will be called woman or whoa, man, because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And watch this part, it's so important. And the two are united into one. You see, family connection is deep because they are part of us. There is a oneness 
that we all long for and we all need. And God created that in family. Now listen, listen to King David talking about his, about Father God. Listen to what he says in Psalms chapter 68, verses five through six. He says this, Father, he's a, God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. This is God. Now watch this. Whose dwelling is holy. And I love this next statement. God places the lonely in families. Let's just read that again. God places the lonely in family. See, family is God's idea. It's his safe place for us to grow, to be stronger. Listen to King David in the midst of great pain. He's incredibly sick. Lots of scholars have questioned about what he's wrestling with. It's whatever it is, he is very, very sick. And in the midst of this sickness, this, this whatever disease he's facing in Psalms 38, verses eight through 11, listen to what David writes. He says this, I am exhausted and I'm completely crushed. My groans come from an anguish that's way down deep in my heart. Remember, this whole series is about inner strength. Not just be strong, being strong on the outside, because if we're strong on the inside, we can face anything this life throws at us. It says, my groans come from an anguished heart. You know what I long for, Lord. You hear my every sigh, every <sighs> deep breath and pain. My heart beats wildly. My strength fails. I am going blind. What's going on in David's life? My loved ones and my friends, they stay away. They fear my disease. And watch this next statement. Listen to his heart. Even my own family stands at a distance. Even my own flesh and blood, my own DNA, those I should be one with, they won't come near me. They just stand at a distance. And many of you listening to this message today, you've gone through that in your family. You face great brokenness in your family. As a matter of fact, as a pastor, I talk to people more about family wounds, especially father wounds, more than anything else. I have a great friend who recently, unexpectedly, out of nowhere, her mother, who she loved dearly, died. She had, um, I believe it was a stroke, and she died instantly. It was just so heartbreaking, so much loss, so much pain. She was devastated by this sudden loss of her mom. Uh, when my friend started talking about her mom at the memorial service that I was at recently, she said to the people in the room that day, she said, I have three words to define my relationship with my mom. Now, I don't remember what she said after the first word, but here was the first word that she said to describe her relationship with her mom. Complicated. Now, that blew my mind because I know how much my friend loved her mom. I know what a close, incredibly close relationship. They talked every single day. So for my friend to start this talk saying that the first word to describe my mom and my relationship was complicated, I'm gonna tell you right now, it had me leaning in on the edge of my seat. I wanna hear what my friend has to say about this. You see, the deepest relationships of our life are often on the other side of complexity. Let me, let me give you a definition of complicated. The definition of complicated is this, consisting of many interconnecting parts or elements, intricate, involving many different and confusing aspects. If that's not family, I don't know what else is, all right? Many different elements, intricate, involving many different and confusing aspects, that is family. It can be so confusing, but yet we've, it's so vital. Um, she spent the next several minutes describing her relationship with her mom and the difficulties in the relationship she had when she was younger. Her mom went through a divorce when she was very, very young. They had differences in faith. My friend became a strong believer in Jesus as a teenager. Her mom wasn't a believer in Jesus. But over the years, they worked hard on their relationship. They pushed through their differences. They pushed through the complicated and developed a deep connection. Did you hear that? They pushed through the complicated and they developed a deep connection. See, the problem is most of us, we aren't willing to do the hard work of growing through complicated to become stronger in our relationships with our family. Now, listen to this illustration for just a moment. If a speck of sand gets in your eye, the first thing it does is it causes irritation. And if you don't care for that, it'll cause an infection. And over time, you will lose vision in your eye. Now, if a speck of sand goes into an oyster, it causes irritation, and then a fluid surrounds it and makes a pearl. Here's the question. 
Did the sand cause the loss of vision or did the sand cause the pearl? Did it cause the results, the loss of vision or the pearl? Technically, no. The sand is just an irritant that reveals the inner properties of the eye and of the oyster. Because if that was the case, then be careful the next time you get a piece of sand in your eye, a pearl may pop out, okay? See, here's what you have to know today. In our families, we are living with irritants. All right, let's not get too carried away with that, but we get on each other's nerves. We can irritate each other. If you're watching with family right now, just turn to them and smile and say, eh, just be nice about it, okay? They're not causing us to be the way that we are. They're revealing the way we already are. You see, my kids don't make me impatient. They reveal my impatience, my lack of maturity, and my lack of growth. That's what they do. But here's what you have to know today. I'm not gonna be able to deal with or speak to all the deep pains of family. That's another series for another time. I just, I got off the phone recently with a good friend of mine, a young lady who I've had the privilege of mentoring and encouraging her husband and I, I've known him for a long time, is almost like a son to me. And she just was telling me about wounds and her relationship with her dad and some of the pain that she's gone through and the things that she's faced. It's been incredibly, incredibly difficult. I, I can't get to all of those places. Some of you have gone through great abuse in your life and your families. I can't get to all that today. But today what I wanna do, and, and, and let me just say this, we provide counseling. We have people and pastors and leaders that would love to talk with you. We wanna walk with you in that pain. But right now in this, in this message, I can't get to all the intricacies of that kind of pain. But today I wanna to give you two simple yet profound practices that will make any relationship and especially our families stronger. I promise you, if you'll put these into practice, you will be stronger. Now, you have to understand this. Today's message, this part what I'm gonna get into right now is as practical as last week was intense, okay? Last week was super intense. And if you didn't hear last week's message, go back and listen to it, it's really important. Today is super practical, super profound, yet very, very simple. I have over 60 extended family members who attend Pure Heart. It's crazy, um, but I love it. Moms and dads and in-laws and cousins and aunts and uncles and a brother and sibling. It's just amazing. And no one knows us like family. It's such an honor for me that over 60 family, extended family members call Pure Heart home. And you might think to yourself, well, you must be really good in family relationships, right? I wasn't always good at it, but I've gotten a lot better. I've had some real pain in my life over the years in relationships. My mom and dad, I was an a great irritant to them when I was a teenager. Matter of fact, I disobeyed them so much and caused them so much pain. At age 18, my dad loved me enough to ask me to leave home. It was the greatest thing my father, one of the greatest things my father has ever done in my life is to say, listen, you're disrespecting your mother and I. We love you dearly, but you cannot continue to treat us this way. He set a great boundary for my mom and my relationship and he asked me to move out and I grew up quick. I don't know where I would be today if my dad hadn't loved me enough to set that kind of a boundary. But I got kicked out at age 18. In, in my first marriage, I talked about this last week, super vulnerable, I don't wanna get that vulnerable again this week, but understand this, I was married at age 20 and I was divorced at age 27. And the two practices I'm gonna share with you today, I didn't live out well with my mom and dad and even my brother, and I definitely didn't, didn't live this out well in my first marriage. And I have to own that. I am responsible for that. So these two practices I'm going to share with you if we will walk this out with other people, if we will walk this out, especially in our family, we will be stronger. Now, these two practices, we do really well with these two practices when it comes to strangers and other people and friends and people go to school with and people we work with, but we don't do this well with family. This is a universal issue. I hear this from everybody. All the family members I talk to, people I counsel and encourage, they tell me they don't see this happen enough in their own family. So here it is, here it comes. This is not, this is not complicated, this part. <laughs> family is, but this isn't. It's so simple, so profound. Two things, if we start doing these this week, today, our families will get stronger. Number one, gratitude. Number two, kindness. Gratitude and kindness. Here's the deal. We take our families for granted. And all the mothers out there said, <laughs> amen. Uh, if we treated people at work or at school, or friends the way we treat our family, we wouldn't have any friends and we would probably lose a lot of jobs. And the reason that we struggle 
with this, the reason that we struggle with this, showing gratitude and kindness, is because family is so complicated. And I'm not asking you to ignore the issues in your family. You may have some great pain in your family. I'm asking you simply to do this. This is what I'm asking you to do. This is what I'm learning. This is what I'm growing in. I'm asking us to see the good first. We are so close to our family that oftentimes we only see the things that are frustrating us and irritating us. And they're not becoming pearls, okay? They were causing us to lose vision and to hurt one another. See, what if instead of complaining about how much your spouse works, maybe start thanking them for working? What about instead of grumbling about how much your spouse focuses on the kids, you take time to thank them for caring about your kids? Or, or what about with our, with our children, with our teenagers, with our kids? What if we told them how grateful we were for the good things in their life instead of harping constantly on the things that irritate us about them? It's easy to focus on our kids' weaknesses. You wanna know why? Here's the truth about us. Here's the truth about me. We're afraid they won't thrive. We're afraid they're gonna mess up. And when we live our lives and our vision for our family out of fear with our kids, we hold on tightly. We control. We're constantly nitpicking. We're constantly trying to deal with every little thing. We make every little issue in life a mountain to die on. And also, here's the thing. Our kids are a reflection of us. And so there's a pride in it. There's a little angst about it. And I mean, I can confront people as a pastor. I can confront people on financial issues. I can confront them on marriage issues. I can confront people on all kinds of behavioral issues. No one gets as upset until I confront them on what their kids are doing. Because it's such a prideful situation. People get so upset. So what I've been doing in my own family, again, I want to say this, I'm not telling us that we shouldn't deal with some of the big issues. Don't hear what I'm not saying today, okay? Some of you got some really, really big issues. I'm saying if we just start with gratitude and kindness, we can literally begin to transform our families and get stronger. So here, I've been doing this. I've been taking a gratitude, a gratitude inventory of my family. And then I've been sharing that with them and encouraging them in it. So I, I've been thinking about this, like with my wife, Nicole. Um, when I think about her, I, I, I am so grateful for her love for family. My wife loves our family like nobody else. She just loves them. She's a servant. My wife loves to serve. Her gift of hospitality. She just always looking for ways to love people. The Bible calls us to be servants of other people, to serve other people. It's one of the greatest virtues. I know in our culture, we don't value it as a virtue. You're servant and wife. You're like, ah, we get all upset. My wife loves to serve people, especially her family. One of the things I'm grateful for is her faithfulness. My wife is faithful to Jesus and she's faithful to me. And I'm grateful for that. She brings joy. My wife has the most amazing laugh. She has so much fun. She has so much joy. Our kids love to be around her. I love to be around her. Josh, our oldest son, his people skills. I'm grateful for the way that he is with people. He loves people. He can talk to anybody, anywhere, at any time. I love his compassion. Now, we have a, a beautiful little girl that we've adopted, Olivia. She's now part of our family. And um, her mom has wrestled with drugs for many, many years. And my son, Josh, is one of the only people who will ask me constantly, how is her mom doing? Everybody else asks me, how is Olivia doing? How are you guys doing? And Josh will say, I wonder how her mom's doing. Because he has such compassion for people. He's so much fun. And here's the other thing. My son calls me all the time. I know for some of you that's kind of hard because you don't hear from your kids. But I'm just great. Like My son wants to talk to me. He calls me. I'm grateful for that. You know, there's things I can be harping on. You just need to do this, you need to do this, get this straight. There's all kinds of stuff. But I'm learning to focus on the good things first. Our daughter-in-law, Amanda, kindness. Oh my goodness, she is so kind. She is gentle. She's brought some gentleness to our wild family. Um, she's compassionate. She loves people. She's compassionate for people. She cares deeply about the underdog. And she's getting ready to have our grandbaby. So I'm incredibly grateful for what she is going through. And she's about eight months pregnant now. So there's a, the, the pain is real for her. She comes over on Sundays and kind of lays her on the couch, you know. And I'm grateful for her tenacity pushing through this pregnancy. I love her for it. And then there's our, our middle son, Luke. Man, he's disciplined. Man, Luke has so much discipline. He's so much more disciplined than I was at that age. He, he eats well, he exercises, he does all the things I didn't do when I was younger. He's deep. Man, we have conversations about deep things, spiritual things. We can just talk about the deep things of life. And he, same, he's super funny. One of my greatest combinations in a personality to be deep and funny. 
He's got this great sense of humor and he's incredibly wise. I, matter of fact, last week's message that I preached, I had Luke listen to a section of that because I wanted his input before I shared it with all of you. That's the kind of relationship we have. And then Abby, our, our daughter, Abby, oh my goodness, she's so deep. Abby is so deep. And I love, we talk about deep things in life. Uh, we talk about things that her friends are wrestling with, that she's wrestling with, issues of the culture. Like if I wanna talk about um, things that are happening in our culture today, um, same-sex attraction, uh, transitioning, all these things that are hot buttons in our, talk, our culture, Abby loves to talk about these things. And she's so wise and she's so deep. And she has such a great Christian worldview. She has grit. Man, this girl does not give up. She's in it to win it. She is tenacious. Her freshman year in college, she had had straight A's her entire life, top like couple percent of her class, but she went through the, um, the bio one class or biology class and it kicked her butt, but she never gave up. She stayed strong and she pushed through, made the Dean's List in, at Grand Canyon University. And I love that she has that kind of grit and she's witty and she's funny and she has a great sense of justice and she cares. I think about my dad, Harvey. He is a servant and he cares and he's an encourager. I think about my mom. She's insightful and she's knowledgeable. She's a prayer warrior. She's an overcomer. She's faced great abuse in her life when she was a child. She's overcome that and she's helped so many women who faced abuse. I have so many things in my family. I could go on and on and on with my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, and the cousins and aunts and uncles, but I only have so many minutes in this message. Here's what I'm trying to do. I want to model for you. What are those things you're grateful for in your family? And let me ask, let me tell you this. I want you to find detailed examples, not just, oh, you're so kind, or you're so wonderful, or you're so warm, you're so, no, 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 no. Detailed examples, kind of like I shared in this, just the last few minutes of moments when you've seen them do things or say things or love people in a certain way and go, hey, I saw you the other day do this. And I am so grateful for your character. I'm so grateful for the way that you love people. I'm so be detailed. Give them a detailed example because that means so much more. The Bible tells us that love must be sincere, all right? See, here's what gratitude and kindness does. It changes the atmospheres in our home. It changes the atmosphere. Have you ever been really, really frustrated with a family member? It's a rhetorical question. Don't, don't answer out loud. And then you run into somebody who knows that family member really well and they tell you like two or three things about them that they just absolutely love. And they go on and on. Oh, I love your brother. Oh, I love your sister. Oh, I love your mom, your dad, your cousin, your uncle. I just love them. They're so blah, 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 blah. They say these things. And all of a sudden you kind of take a deep breath and you're listening to that and you go, actually, that, that is a strength in their life. But unfortunately, those strengths that other people see get drowned out by us as family because we're so close to the things that drive us crazy about them. And we say things like, well, you don't live with them, <laughs> right? Okay, you don't say it out loud, but internally you say that or you think that. Well, you do, if you only really knew, people will come up to my wife every once in a while, oh, Pastor Dan, he's so wonderful. Like two people have told her that. And when they say that, my, you know, my wife, I, she goes, I wanna say, do y'all live with him? <laughs> do you have to be with him all the time? Because if you lived with me, you wouldn't think I was so wonderful all the time because I'm human just like you. And it's those things in family that we're so close to, they just get on our nerves. But if you want a better relationship with your family, it starts with what we can control. And you know what we can control? Not them, because we've tried that, right? It doesn't work. We can control what we say and what we do. We can control that. So I want to encourage you, look for the things that you appreciate in your family members this week and tell them, that's our action step. It's really simple. That's our action step. Look for them and tell them. Now, here's what you have to understand. Some of you right now might be thinking, how can I do this for such ungrateful people and rude people? You have no idea what my family does. You don't know how they talk to me. You have no idea how they treat me. There's probably some moms right now, some dads right now that feel unappreciated, some kids that feel like their parents don't understand you. Listen to me. Here, let me give you a promise from the writer Paul in the New Testament. Paul writes this to the church in Galatia. He says this, Galatians 6, 7. This is a promise in the Bible. Own it this week. Don't be misled. You, you cannot mock the justice of God. Now watch this. You will always harvest what you plant. Another translation says it this way. You will always reap what you sow. You plant corn in the ground, you're gonna get corn. You plant beans, you're gonna get beans. You plant love in people's lives, eventually you're gonna to start to get love in return. Maybe not right away, not in the timing that you want. You plant gratitude, you're gonna get gratitude. You plant kindness seeds, you're gonna get kindness. And it may take some time. Not all fields are as fertile as others. 
Not all relationships are ready to grow. But here's the thing. First of all, you'll be honoring God. And God's called us to be a grateful people. The Bible tells us it's the kindness of God that leads to change and repentance. So the more grateful we are, the kinder we are, the more we're going to act like Jesus. And the more that we'll know we're honoring him. So let's do it this week. Here, here's what we're going to do. The first action step I just mentioned, find one thing to be grateful for about your family members and tell them in detail. Let them know. Here's why. You have to do this because we know this. Unexpressed gratitude is experienced by other people as ingratitude. That's just the truth. When we don't express gratitude, you may say, well, I feel grateful. I'm grateful for my family. Have you told them? Because unexpressed gratitude is experienced by other people as ingratitude. And the second thing is find one kind thing that you can do for them. Something kind to do for them. Let me tell you why again. Here's why this is important. Because unexpressed kindness is experienced by others as rudeness. It's just the truth. So you may have thought of something, you know, I ought to buy that, I ought to do that, I ought to say that, I ought to, I ought to do this for them. And you think of these kind things throughout the day, but the busyness of life and the stress of family phew, wipes it away. I and mean, we're kinder to strangers. We open doors for people. We do things for people. But not our own family sometimes. Recently, I had a crazy day at home. I was in my office for like, six and a half hours working on my sermon. And then I had to do bills. It was that day. And I, on Mondays, I write almost all day long. I write, I get up early in the morning, get up about five o'clock and I start writing. And I'm in my office a long, long time. Olivia, our little baby girl, she comes over and bangs on the glass. So my window <laughs> licks the glass and I get interrupted several times. It's, it's worth it though. Um, and then Nicole's trying to get stuff done around the house and make sure Olivia's not bothering me. So she gets a little annoyed sometimes. She gets a little frustrated because I'm in my office so long on Mondays. And, you know, before when she was working outside the home, um, it didn't bother her because she wasn't there. But now we're home together and it's worlds colliding. And I'm trying to work on sermons and she's trying to get stuff done around the house and the worlds are colliding. And so I was in there for six and a half hours working on bills, working on my sermon. I came out, I was exhausted, mentally drained. And I'm standing there in the kitchen sink getting a glass of water. And my wife came up from behind me and she gave me a hug. And she said, she said, look at me. And I turned around and I go, hey. And she says, thank you for always working so hard. Thank you for providing all these years. We're going to be married 25 years this summer. Thank you for the last 25 years, how hard you've worked for our family. I know how much you've done to balance the books and try to make things happen. And especially when we were first married. I mean, in our first several years of marriage, I think my total household income was $19,000. We had three children. And I think I brought home like $1,800 a month. We were broke as a joke. And she said, I don't know how you did all those years. Thank you for always working so hard on the bills. Thank you for keeping that stress off of my life. Thank you for the security that God's allowed you to bring into my life. And thank you for working so hard. And then she smiled. She says, now, can I make you something to eat? What do you want to eat? You tell me, I'll make it. That was so powerful. I felt so seen. I felt so valued. I felt empowered. I felt stronger. Suddenly there was a skip in my step. Suddenly my mental fog lifted. And my wife's Gratitude and her kindness strengthened me. It was such a powerful moment. You see, when we love our families this way, we will strengthen the relationships in our family. And when our relationships in our family get stronger, we get stronger. And when we get stronger, it affects us in every area of our life, emotionally and even physically. As I said in the beginning of this message, one of the greatest pred predictors of longevity is the strength of your relationships especially with your family, because God created this this way. He created us to live and to thrive in our families. And if we start creating a new atmosphere in our homes and with our kids and with our extended families and our brothers and our sisters of gratitude and kindness, we can change the atmosphere. We could strengthen our lives by strengthening our relationships. God can help you do this. He can help you push past your frustrations and your irritants and the pain and to love like he loves. He can do this in your life. Listen to what the writer Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Listen to one more heartbeat of God, how he feels about family. He says this, Paul writes, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. Isn't that beautiful? By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. 
See, God wants you to be in his family. So much so, he entered into this broken, irritating, messed up world in the form of Jesus Christ, walked among us, loved us, laid his life down for us, rose again from the dead, and through our relationship with receiving the power of what he did for us on the cross, we now enter into God's family. We go from just being God's creation to his very own children through relationship with Jesus. And it says at the end of this verse, this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. The greatest joy that God the Father has is bringing you and me into his family through his son, Jesus Christ. Family matters to the heart of God, and family matters to our heart. So here's what I wanna encourage you to do right now. Some of you listening today, maybe for the first time in your life, you're ready to come home to God's family. You're ready to say yes to Jesus, to his leadership, to his love, to his forgiveness. And when you do that, you enter into God's family. I don't know what your family on earth is like. I don't know how broken it is. I don't know your story, but God does. And he wants to bring you home into his family today by saying yes to his son, Jesus Christ. So for some of you, it'll be the first time to make this decision. Others of you, it's more of a rededication of your life to Christ. So if that's you today, first time decision, or today you wanna to come home to Jesus, come home to his family today, then pray this with me right now in your heart. Pray this, Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. Jesus, I trust you with my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You know it all anyway. I'm honest right now. I've sinned, I've messed up. Thank you for your forgiveness. Jesus, fill me with your very presence. Fill me with your hope and your love and your joy and your peace. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing me into your family. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I love your family. Thank you for hanging out with us today. Next week, we're gonna go dive deeper into relationships. We're gonna get a little extra intense, but it's gonna be really, really good for us because the strength of our relationships will determine the strength of our life. Have a strong week, everybody. Well, wasn't that an encouraging message? I can't wait to take some of those little tips and tools home and build stronger relationships with my family and those around me. And I pray that you are able to walk away with some really exciting things to help you strengthen your relationships around you. Well, if you just made that decision for the very first time, we wanna celebrate with you. Let us know that you just accepted Jesus into your heart by going to pureheart.org slash hand raise. That decision is something worth celebrating. It's something worth letting somebody know so that we can join you in your new journey with Jesus and encourage you and let you know what your next steps are because we all have next steps. I love our online campus. I love what happens on our online campus. I love the connections that we get to make. You know, Pure Heart's online campus makes room for personal connection to happen with people all over the world who are physically unable to step foot onto a church campus. In this year, our reach for Easter, we were able to connect with over 7,000 people across 165 countries whom we saw make decisions to follow Jesus and even who joined us for the first time. Having our online campus available, not just on the weekend, but during the week for people who are having a difficult Monday or are going through doubt and worry in the middle of the week and really just need to hear something positive and encouraging, are able to tune back into powerful messages in times of worship together until the circumstances change in their lives. This online campus is an important resource to reach people for Jesus and it's only going to continue to grow and we have you to thank for that. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for people who have given generously to Pure Heart and the mission, God, of the online campus to reach people for Jesus, to show them the love of God through this resource. We just know that as we are continuously faithful with what you've put in our hands, God, you will bless in abundance, God. And I just thank you for the hearts who will give to this mission and for the lives that will be changed because of that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, thanks for tuning in with us here today. If you like this message, share it with a friend. It's worth being shared. And we'll see you back here next week.
If you were blessed by the service today, like this video, share it with a friend. This service may be exactly what they need to lift them up and encourage them today. This online campus is growing with new and exciting releases, new worship songs, growth tools for your spiritual walk, podcasts, uplifting and powerful sermons. So go ahead, click on the Pure Heart logo to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out.